but there's a point where I said, you know what? Maybe, maybe God made me and fashioned me for destruction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Vessel for because he because he, he says he does that. Jacob I have loved, Esau I've hated, through, for the good pleasure of his own will. To That's the right. Of his and world. and he receives no counsel but his own about yep. that. And so there's nothing I'm going to be able to do to change his mind about it. So maybe it's all real and I'm just not chosen. And yeah. that's a thing I'm going to have to just, that's just a thing I'm going to have to reckon with. Yeah. And that's not a thing I can really do anything about. How do you handle encountering someone like this who says, I, I know everything you're going to tell me. And might might know it better than you do. And the first the first thing to remember is it's not your job to pretend to be the Holy Spirit of God. It is your job to speak the Spirit's truth. And if he already knows that, you know, maybe you can express it in some different words, but you you can't improve on what the Spirit's already already written in scripture. And so there are situations where you you would look at someone and he himself said it right at the end. He says, hey, maybe I'm not alive. And he, that to anyone with any spiritual life should be absolutely terrifying. And maybe at other moments for Derek it is. I don't know. I don't know. I really don't. Like I said, I I learned about all this long after it took place. He may be a completely tortured soul at night. I have no idea. But the fact is, he knows what God's word requires of him. And he knows that he will be held accountable for repentance. And the fact that he can just sip his latte and go might indeed indicate having been given over. And are those are there people who have been? If your theology is no, God, God never gives anyone over, despite Romans one. We don't, we can't. That's we we're not going to worry about. That. Uh, God never gives anyone over. Um. You, you just you just keep trying and trying and trying and trying and trying and trying. Whew, okay. Um, Dr. White, how does God give someone over who was already born given over as a reprobate on Calvinism is? How much more given over can you be than being dead in a grave like Lazarus, unable to see, hear, understand, or turn unless unilaterally picked and irresistibly regenerated. What, what does that even mean? To give, give them over from what? Give them over from being reprobate to being hyper-reprobate? Give them over from being blind to really, really blind? Give them over from being dead to even more deadness than dead dead can be dead? I, what, what does that mean? <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't make sense. And it seems that James White thinks that we as provisionists don't believe that God may judicially harden or give over someone who continually rebels. Yet that's the basis of our whole systematic reasons for rejecting Calvinistic theology in the first place. The interlocutor in Romans 9 that we always appeal to is the judicially hardened Jew who has grown calloused and hardened in his rebellion, the same interlocutor that Paul addressed in Romans chapter 3. Why, if our unrighteousness brings about your righteousness, God, would you still blame us? The exact same person who is saying, why would you blame us if you created us for this, God, or if you've molded us as a hardened lump for this? What's Paul talking about? If I've taken an already hardened lump of clay who has become like this, as Jeremiah 18 describes, has become like this because of his rebellion, rebellion. And if I want to take that marred lump of clay, not that God himself marred, but that marred themselves because of their rebellion. And if I want to take that marred lump of clay and shape it and use it to cry out, crucify him to bring about redemption for the world, then who are you to question God for doing that? That's the interlocutor in Romans nine. That's the judicially hardened person. And he doesn't seem to even think that we believe that God may give over people to their reprobate hearts and minds. He doesn't understand theology that we hold to apparently, because on Calvinism, they're born either given over or not based upon their reprobate state as a dead like the tea of tulip, unable to believe sinner. Now, 
I want you to understand this. Giving someone over or hardening them from our perspective means to remove the light. Cease persuading. You stop making the appeal. In other words, if I'm holding out my hands to you all day long, as Paul, as, as Paul describes it, quoting from God himself from Isaiah, in fact, um, longing to gather them under his wings, all of the, 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 the imagery of Scripture of holding out and longing for and desiring the, something that the people are unwilling to have happen. Okay, Th- that imagery is there, but he does not. He he will not strive with man forever, according to Scripture. Eventually, he can give them over. Okay, you want your inheritance? You want to go out into the world and spend it? End up in a pigsty? Okay, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to stop making my appeals. I'm going to stop trying to persuade you. I'm going to stop bringing you the light over and over and over again. Exactly the same way that we handle people oftentimes who are in rebellion. Um, it's the way 1 Corinthians teaches. Paul taught. Um, you you warn the wayward sinner once, you warn them twice, and then you cut them off and you have nothing to do with them so that you, what, may save their souls. What's he talking about? How is cutting somebody off from the church going to save their souls? Exactly the same way that Paul holds out hope for the hardened Israelites who is being who are being cut off in their rebellion in Romans 11. He, he has hope that by cutting them off, it's actually a gracious thing. His hope is that they will be provoked by the circumstances and hardships, like the pigsty of their life. Once they reach the bottom of their barrel, the end of their rope, so to speak, they get the pigsty of their life and they look around and say, I need, I need my church back. I need God. I, I, need, I need him. And cutting somebody off in their rebellion actually can lead to them leaving their unbelief so as to be grafted back in, according to Romans 11. Because they can be jealous. They can see that they can have jealousy of the people who are provided for in the church and the, the, the joy of the people in the church and the provisions of the people in the church. And they can have jealousy of, a, of a, a Jew seeing a Gentile whose life has been radically changed and they're following the God of Yahweh, the, the, God, the God Yahweh, uh, the God of Scripture. And and they get this righteous jealousy that I want to be like that. I want to have that kind of relationship and that can provoke their wills to change so that they may return so as to be healed. That's scripture. That's Bible. Um, and the reason we're pushing back on this is for this very reason is to help people to understand. And please hear me if you're watching this and you're in Derek Webb's uh, world of maybe leaning towards atheism, leaning towards deconstruction, leaning away from Christianity because you've been convinced that Christianity is Calvinistic Christianity, that Christianity is deterministic Christianity, that Christianity is ultimately abrogating your responsibility to humble yourself and trust in him over to God who's unilaterally going to cause that to happen. And you're just going to sit back passively and go, well, if it's going to happen, then it's going to happen. I can't control it. I'm here to tell you that is just pure pagan philosophy being read into the scriptures, and it's not biblical. Do not wait for God to humble you. If you do, you will be waiting until it's too late. And that's why we're doing this. If you can help support us, please do. Uh, We appreciate so much our patrons. If you like and subscribe to this video and you share it with others, that helps us. Um, We've got to start doing better provisionists, and even Arminians at spreading the truth of God's love and provision to all people. There are obviously huge financial benefactors behind the Together for the Gospel, Lingonier, uh, Grace to You, uh, Gospel Coalition Ministries, all of which are centered upon the foundation of the, the Founders Ministry of the SBC. All of these have huge amounts of financing behind them. And they're all centered around, quote-unquote, restoring the gospel, which means restoring Calvinism uh, underneath the surface, restoring Calvinism to the SBC and to other religious organizations. And together for the gospel, what is that? Together for the Calvinistic understanding of the gospel. That's what it is. And unless some of us start stepping up and saying, you know, the emperor has no clothes, brothers and sisters. The elephant is in the room, and we, we have to address the elephant or we're going to continue to see one Megan Phelps and Derek Webb and Paul Marshall and one after another, after another, after another, using Calvinism's excuse as their excuse for continuing in the rebellion. 
and we've got to do something to stop it. Will you help me spread the news of God's love and provision for every man, woman, boy, and girl?